This is the 15th FRQ. This one is a thermochemistry basis. Uh, I'm going to go through the solution to this, but if you want to try the problem before I do that, all you have to do is go down to the description. You'll find a link to this document for the 15th FRQ. But you can go ahead and try it and then come back and look at the answers if you'd like to. Um, here we go. We have a bunch of information. We've got some enthalpy of formation values, some standard entropy values, and some Gibbs uh, free energy formation values. All in a chart for three chemicals that are undergoing a diff um, that are going to undergo a reaction. Part A says explain why the entropy value for HBr that's here in the chart, which is plus 198.7 joules per mole Kelvin, is so much larger than the value for the liquid form of this, which is negative 36. Okay, so we're looking at entropy here, and so we're comparing a gas versus a liquid. So the reason that the value is significantly higher for this than the table is because this one is a gas while this one is for a liquid and gases have higher entropies than liquid states. They have a wider dispersal of energy. Okay. Moving on from there we start to get into some quantitative analysis. So in part B it says figure out the enthalpy of reaction then for this reaction. So to do that we're going to use the chart, we're going to do the sum of all of the products, which in this case there is one. So the C2H5Br, so the bromoethane, and the enthalpy value for that is negative 90. So the enthalpy for the reaction is going to be equal to the products, which is negative 90, minus the entire sum of all of the reactants. So for the reactants, we have the ethene gas and we have the hydrobromic acid gas. So we're going to have 52, positive 52, and then we're going to have plus a negative 36.3. And so if we go ahead and total that, that's going to add up to be negative 105.7. And the units there are kilojoules per mole. Okay. So when this reaction happens, if one mole of this reacts with one mole of this to make one mole of that, then we would produce 105.7 kilojoules. It would be an exothermic process. The surroundings would gain energy. Okay. Then part C asks us to determine the Gibbs free energy for this reaction in kilojoules per mole. So if we had had the values here for the Gibbs energy of formations, we could have just done the same thing we did for part B, but we're missing one. We're missing the hydrobromic acid. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing, but for the entropy values. So we have our enthalpy of reaction. What we need now is we need to know our entropy of reaction. And that's going to be equal to the same process. We have the product, plus 199, minus the sum of the reactants, which is 198.7 plus this 220. Okay, so we're basically, these two are effectively canceling out. It's going to be uh, plus 0.3, uh, but we're going to add the 220 to that, and we're going to end up with a negative value for the total there. It's going to be negative 219.7. So what we want to do is we want to combine this with this, but the units of this are in joules. And so in order to get our answer in kilojoules, we're going to have to change this to 0.2197 to go along with our 105.7. So now we're ready to go ahead and calculate our Gibbs free energy from this. Now our Gibbs free energy, delta G, is going to be equal to our enthalpy minus T delta S. So, and we're looking at standard conditions for all of these. So, our Gibbs free energy is what we're looking for. We know our enthalpy change, we know our entropy change, and we know that our temperature is standard temperature 298 Kelvin. So, we're going to plug in negative 105.7 minus the temperature 298 Kelvin times this negative 0.2197. Okay? And when we do that, we get a Gibbs free energy of, dramatic pause, negative 40.2, oh, I'm sorry, yep, yeah, that's right, negative 40.2 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so everything we've done here has just really been simple, uh, how much products minus reactants does the value come out to according to our table. But what we now have is we now have a wealth of information. We know the enthalpy of the reaction change, we know the entropy change, we know the Gibbs free energy change. From each of those things, we can then decipher a lot of information. 
from the fact that this is negative, this is negative, and this is negative, we now know a lot. So now what it's going to do is it's going to start piecing us back together in order to figure out some more information from that. But before that, when we get into part D, part D says figure out what this number is that's supposed to be here. So what we now know is we now know that the total change for the reaction is negative 40.2, and we know the standard values for the formation of, of two of the compounds. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to figure out, by doing the same process we've been doing over here, what that last value is. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and delete all of this. So we have a total of negative 40.2. Let's go ahead and do this right here in front of me. So we know that our Gibbs free energy change for the reaction is equal to negative 40.2 kilojoules per mole. One of the ways to get that is to take the products minus the reactants. So the products, we have negative 26 minus the reactants, which would be plus 68, and let's call it x. Okay, so we have negative 26 minus 68 plus x. We want to solve for what x is. So let's go ahead and move some things around. Let's go ahead and add this to the other side over here. So we would end up with 68 plus x. And then we would have negative 26. And let's move the 40.2. So then x is going to be equal to negative 26 plus 40.2 minus 68. which then totals out to be 53.8 negative kilojoules per mole. So we can then plug in that this is negative 53.8 kilojoules per mole. And that would be our solution to part D. So now we're going to go ahead and scoot down a little bit, take a look at some of the later questions. So we have our solution to part D, now we're going to look at part E. In part E it says explain how the temperature of the surroundings would change as the reaction proceeds. So if we're looking at the chemical mixture as our system, and I want to know what's going to happen to the temperature of the surroundings, what I'm basically saying is here's my mix of chemicals, here's the surroundings. We are sending energy from the system to the surroundings. So the fact that we have a negative enthalpy change means that our chemical rearrangement is causing energy to be released to the surroundings. So the surroundings are going to see the temperature increase as the reaction proceeds because the enthalpy change is negative. So our system, our chemical mixture, is losing energy. That energy is going to go to the surroundings, and therefore we expect the temperature to go up. Then in part F, Identify when this reaction would be spontaneous and justify your choice. So we know that it's spontaneous as is. So at 298 Kelvin, we know all these to be true. However, we also know that delta G is going to change, assuming that the enthalpy change and uh, entropy changes are relatively constant. As temperature changes, that's going to create a larger and larger impact uh, from the entropy change on Gibbs free energy. The fact that this is negative means that delta G will be negative because of that alone. So delta H being negative gives us a negative delta G quantity. Delta S being negative, however, because that's subtracted, that's going to cause this to be more positive. So as T becomes larger, that's going to carry more weight for this influence. Eventually, this is going to cross over from being negative to positive. So when this reaction would be spontaneous, this will be at lower temperatures. And specifically, temperatures where T delta S is less than delta H in terms of magnitude alone, ignoring the signs. When the enthalpy change is bigger than this quantity, that's when that reaction is going to be spontaneous. The minute that the temperature times the entropy becomes larger in amount, regardless of direction, than the enthalpy change, that's when we're going to see this go from being spontaneous to not being spontaneous. Okay? And the last part says draw a reaction energy diagram for this reaction. Okay. So we know a couple things, but, but the biggest thing we know here is we know that delta H is going to be negative. But let's also go ahead and look at the reaction itself. So we have ethene 
reacting with HBr gas. So, so this is a, an alkene, we have a dull bond, we have an electron-rich source right here. So we're looking for a nucleophile, so we're looking for something positively charged. And of this molecule, it's polar, where the hydrogen is, pol is the positive. So we're going to see the H plus form a bond with one of the two carbons from the result of that pi bond of the double bond. So the first thing we're going to form here is we're going to form a CH3, CH2 carbocation intermediate. So a positive charge on that. And then the bromine is going to retain those electrons and have a negative charge. Like that. So that's the first step of this reaction. And then in the second step, the bromide is going to bond to the carbocation is a negative and positive charge, and we're going to end up forming bromoethane. So we'll stick that bromine on there. And then our five hydrogens. So for our reaction energy diagram, we're plotting out how the energy changes as this reaction proceeds. So we're starting here where we have ethene and HBr, so C2H4 and HBr. It has a certain amount of energy to it. Then, we have to add an H plus to form this intermediate. Okay? So we're going to require some energy. And of the two steps, this one is our slower step because this is a very difficult thing to form, a very unstable thing. So we're going to form an intermediate with a lot of instability. So at this point here, we are here. At this point here, we are here. But we haven't mixed those two yet. Okay. Then, very quickly after you form that, and very easily, these two things are going to react with each other. So we're going to have a very small second activation energy. And then, our final products are lower in enthalpy than our initial products. So we're going to move down below this point, and down to here, before we form our final products. So from a thermodynamics perspective, we are starting with less total internal energy than we end with from a chemical potential energy perspective. But, in addition to that, if we know the organic mechanism of this, we can also look at the middle as to what's going on. We have our rate determining step here with the larger activation energy, and then we have a second step to turn the intermediate into the products with a very small activation energy. This would be very fast. So we could write this in elementary steps, um, or we could just look at the beginning and end. So, for example, in the next question, in part G, it asks us to look at what's the equilibrium constant. And for that, all that matters is where we start and where we end as far as Gibbs free energy. Okay? So if we scroll down some more, determine the equilibrium constant for this reaction under standard conditions. Now, the equation for Gibbs free energy into... equilibrium constants is this, or we could rewrite it solved for the equilibrium constant, which is what we're going to want, which is e to the negative delta g naught over rt. So this is essentially a plug and chug equation, and if you're in an advanced chemistry class, you're probably not too intimidated by that. But you should be a little, because the unit analysis on this is pretty unfamiliar for a lot of things here. So if we want the equilibrium constant, we're going to plug in e, we're going to plug in our negative, now, for the delta G naught, we want to plug it in in joules per mole. And our answer originally was in kilojoules per mole. So, in joules per mole, we're looking at negative 40,200 joules per mole. And the reason for that is because the R value, 8.314, is in joules per mole Kelvin. And then our temperature, 298 Kelvin. So, we have 40,200 divided by 8.314 times divided by 298. The negatives here are going to cancel, and we're going to have a positive exponent. So we end up with a very large number. It's 1.13 times 10 to the seventh power. So what we see here is that we're seeing a very heavily product-favored reaction, where we're going to, at equilibrium, we'll have majority products and very, very few reactants. That makes sense from an equilibrium perspective, because our delta G being negative, for the standard Gibbs free energy, implies that our, our reaction is, is favorable towards forming products. It's going to be spontaneous in the forward direction, given equivalent quantities of both things. So, it's not a surprise that we see a large k value to accompany a negative delta g naught value. Okay. 
Uh, but if you've never plugged one of these in before, there's a lot of missteps you can do. So you need the joules per mole to cancel with this, the kelvins to cancel to give you your unitless equilibrium constant. Um, because equilibrium constants don't have units, they're, they're used with activity.